Hello everyone and welcome to another Word Electronics webinar. My name is Silas Zorn and I will moderate this webinar today. We are very pleased that you took the time to participate in our webinar. The topic of today's webinar is Power Distribution Systems. The speaker of today's webinar are Isaac Abu El Saad from Word Electronics and Timon Buse von Infineon. Hello Isaac and Timon, cool to have you here. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you, cool. Um, then, uh, before we start with the presentation, I would like to give you some more information. You will be muted during this webinar. This means that you cannot ask us questions via your microphone, but you have the opportunity to ask your questions into the chat. After the presentation, Isaac and Timon will be answering your questions in a short Q&A session. And um, if you are unable to answer all your questions live within this time, we will answer them uh, later via email. So now, last information from my side, you will all receive the link to the presentation as well as to the recording in the next days. So now, I will hand over to Isaac and Timon, and I wish you an exciting webinar. Thank you. All right, yeah, from my side also a very warm welcome to this webinar. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to be uh, present here in this webinar hosted by both of our companies. You will see that we have a very complementary portfolio when it comes to power distribution systems. Um, but me, myself, I will start with a bit of a broader scope. Um, the title already gives it away. I want to talk about zone architectures. Yeah? So we will learn that power distributions are very much associated with zone architectures. And in order to understand how to be successful in power distribution systems, really the, the basics for that is to understand how the migration towards zone architectures is functioning. So this is where we will kick it off. And um, it is, um, I'm starting you off with trying to find, trying to identify a definition for zone architectures. Now, this is a very difficult task that a lot of people have attempted. And um, depending on you ask who you ask, the definition will be vastly different. It might be that we have a software engineer saying, hey, uh, zone architectures is about aggregating software and reduced number of ECUs. And then maybe another person, a communication expert might say, it's more about the, the um, communication protocols that are being standardized through the in-vehicle network. And uh, you can list plenty more ideas than what is listed here, but uh, even, even the last one is true because um, there is a lot of statements about what a zone architecture is. They are true for their individual needs, for the individual OEMs that are pursuing them, but there is no one fits all definition. So what we very often do and what we advocate for is that we don't look at what a zone architecture is, but what the underlying motivation is. And here we don't talk about the, I think that uh, zone architecture is this and this, but I want to achieve this and this by migrating to a zone architecture. And this is where the, uh, the important OEMs, the main players on the market agree. Um, I wanna talk you through the major goals uh, very quickly. The first one is that uh, all OEMs always want to reduce the weight of their cars, and therefore also they want to reduce the weight of the EE system. The EE system physically is constituted through the, the wiring harness and a few ECUs, uh, which amounts up to around 50 to 90 kilos, depending on the vehicle. So there's room for improvement. They want to tap into that room for improvement. Then the second goal is very much uh, um, associated with the installation, uh, the, the installation and the manufacturing of the wiring harnesses. Um, for every model, every different car that an OEM produces, there is a different wire harness as of now. This means that there's a huge variety, diversity as to the EE systems that are required, which basically makes automation impossible. So we have a lot of manual work, which consumes money, time, everything that is business critical for OEMs. So this is an important goal to ease this and to have standardized, easier assembly, installation and maintenance. Then uh, a timeless classic in the automotive industry. Everyone wants to reduce system costs and that's no, no different here. And that's also a goal associated with zone architectures. Um, but it's not only cost either, it's 
also about providing more value for, for the customer. And in case of OEMs that are going for zone architectures, the customers are the drivers and what the OEMs want to provide them with is more safety and comfort. And then lastly, electromobility. Yeah? It's an obvious one, but uh, not to be forgotten. Um, OEMs want to put, put electric vehicles on the road. Now, if we take all of those statements and we abstract them just a bit further, uh, we will uh, come to, let's say, an abstracted uh, high level goal, which is true for any uh, OEM, any automotive player going for zone architectures, which is that in this transition, they're trying to build better EE systems at less cost. Um, remember that because it comes back in a second. All right. Now, what I've done is I've told you the, the what of um, what the OEMs are trying to achieve. And now I want to talk about the how. So the measures that the OEMs are taking in order to achieve these goals by transforming the EE architecture. And um, I could do this in a very tedious way and talk you through all of the individual measures, but this webinar only has a limited length. Uh, so luckily for you and for me, I've chosen to simplify a bit. But um, the simplification is a very valid one because any measure that an OEM might take in this in this transition is either a measure that reduces hardware complexity or software complexity. So it falls into either of those two categories. And I will give you a few selected um, a few selected examples that will lead us then also towards power distribution systems. So if we go from in this picture from left to right, what we can see on the left, we have an abstract illustration of a current architecture. And now if we move to zone architectures, so the right side of this picture, we see that power is initially is, is uh, distributed in a fundamentally different way. So on the left, we have cables spanning the entire length of the vehicle. On the right, we have a uh, primary power distribution that is uh, this orange box there, yeah? the primary power distribution unit. And from there, we have a few individual cables providing power to the zone control units. And in the zones, uh, then the power is distributed directly from the zone controller to the uh, individual endpoints that are consuming the energy inside the zones. Um, now, there are several benefits attached to this, but I think the, the most obvious one is that here we have less cables, uh, less long cables as well. So we have for sure a reduced weight of the EE system. So it's a hardware complexity reduction measure that directly links into our first goal. But it also makes assembly and installation easier, right? If you have less cables and there's less uh, less fastening of the cables to the frame of the vehicle to do, so this becomes less time incentive, less labor work, less production time. It's good for us. All right, but there's more measures, and um, the second one is an important one. So this is going to be coming back later. It's the introduction of secondary power distribution units. We have the primary power distribution unit. This is where the energy is coming from. The secondary power distribution uh, units are those, let's, let's call them very colored boxes. And if you do a left to right comparison, you will see that this is not a fundamentally new idea. We had those in previous or in current architectures. There, what we're talking about mainly is relay and fuse boxes. Um, now, in zone architectures, the secondary power distribution, first of all, becomes a part of the zone controller. So it's virtually, literally uh, components inside the zone controller and then it is electrified. And electrified means that we don't take traditional melting fuses anymore, but now we take semiconductors. Um, those semiconductors typically fulfill the same function as a fuse, which is why they're sometimes called e-fuses, but they have a lot of benefits. And besides others there, for example, online resettable and online diagnosable, and that beyond others makes, for example, the maintenance easier. So again, it's a measure that contributes into uh, our second goal in this case. Then just to, to paint the picture entirely, another measure that we're taking, it's now a software complexity reduction measure is called functional aggregation. You can see on the left side that we have a lot of uh, yellow shapes at the ends of all the cables. Those are endpoint ECUs, for example, a body control module or something like this. In zone architectures, we're taking several of those endpoint ECUs. Uh, we are aggregating their function in a single more powerful microcontroller and that microcontroller is part of the zone controller. And by doing so, we're uh, again, we're saving components or less components, therefore less weight, therefore easier assembly. We're reducing the cost of the system, obviously, uh, but we're also creating a lot of software benefits because now we have an abstraction layer between hardware and software where, for example, software over the air becomes possible. Yeah? So this also plays into our fourth goal of safety and comfort. And now let's go for 
a last measure and uh, then we look more into the details which is the introduction you can see it now in purple on your right side of the picture the introduction of a 48 volt domain um, if we go into 48 volt which some innovative oems are already looking into uh, we will have 48 volt batteries and then a 48 volt primary power distribution and then the energy is distributed on this 48 volt rail to the zone controllers and there the first instance is a, is a dc dc controller uh, sorry a dc dc converter that down converts from 48 volt to 12 so volts so that the zones can operate as they have been previously been operated all right um now let me wrap this up and, and link back to uh, my statement from the last slide. Um, an important takeaway here is that zone architectures and decentralized electrified power distribution systems are the logical consequence of me trying to optimize my system and trying to achieve those what goals. So it's not a uh, fancy idea as someone creative that came up with this approach. It's the logical consequence, the result of me going through my individual uh, transformation measures. All right. And if you want to make it very short, it is a means to build better EE systems at less costs, obviously. All right. This much for introduction. Now, um, you can see I'm already toying a bit with the uh, customer perspective and a typical customer question that uh, we are facing that you will also face is how can you then enable in these new EE architectures functional safety ASLD for my EE system? Um, this is a uh, fundamental prerequisite for a lot of things such as ADA systems, steer by wire, brake by wire, and so on. So it is certainly coming. Therefore, we should look into how semiconductors and the complementary passive components can help us to, to build such systems. So if we talk about ACLD, typically what we do is uh, that we decompose the ACLD requirement into several ACLB domains. Uh, you can see an example here where, for example, the steering uh, function is provided uh, with power through two uh, separate ACLB systems. Yeah, There's a, a decomposition um, that allows us to create an overall ACLD. Now, the problem is that um, those those individual systems are still linked through through wires. Yeah? So there's electrical connections, which means that we need safety elements. I uh, provided here with SE, which are essentially fuses, yeah? so they're E fuses, and they can disconnect failures. So if we have one of the two ACLB power supplies failing, then we want to isolate those by opening all the safety elements so that the other ACLB power supply is still working. And therefore, we have this redundancy, which allows us on system level to have an ACLD certification. Now, in order to do this, we do need, I've mentioned it several times, E fuses. Um, the problem with standard fuses, you can see it here on the right side of the picture in the left plot uh, the problem of real fuses and standard conventional fuses and also relays is that they have a way too long tripping time so in between the point of failure and uh, the the release time of the fuse where the fuse blows and we have separated the connection the voltage has already do dropped to zero which means we have a total failure of the system which we probably or potentially cannot recover from. Yeah? This is something we need to avoid. So we need to isolate the failure faster, uh, at least below 0 0.5 uh, microseconds or uh, even lower. And this is possible only with e So in short, in order to build ACLD systems, you will need safety elements, safe semiconductor safety elements, e -fuses. All right. Now, if you want to build this, uh, Infineon has a broad portfolio to offer. I'm not going to go into detail with any of this, but uh, you can see we have um, a lot of our families, product families of smart power switches already uh, ISO 26262 ready or even compliant. And on top of that, any uh, new devices in these family will be completely ISO compliant, meaning that they don't only on technical basis allow you to make the shift to ACLD systems, but they're also already pre-certified, um, allowing you to do a faster functional safety design. Um, obviously, it's not only smart power switches. We might also go for gate drivers and corresponding MOSFETs. Again, we have a very broad portfolio. Um, I'm not going to go into detail with this because we want to stay on, on system level and also talk about the interaction of semiconductors and passive components. But there is uh, quite some material, uh, if, if you want to dive deeper into this, available. All right, um, I want to go through two more questions uh, that typically might arise from customers. Um, one of the concerns is capacitive charging. 
Um, the problem with capacitive charging, as you can see it here um, in the right side of the picture in the left plot, that uh, semiconductors can switch very fast, meaning they can also switch on very fast, um, faster than, for example, relays. Uh, however, if we do this, um, and we have a capacitive load, uh, then let's go back to physics 101, the, um, the capacitive load for the first instance of uh, closing the circuit, so of letting current through, acts as a short circuit. So we will have a very high current leading potentially to a destructive behavior. Now, uh, we want to avoid this, that's the system target on the left, but we don't only want to avoid it, we also want to uh, avoid having to overdimension the device for this high inrush currents. Yeah? And uh, mechanics uh, that we're employing to do so is what you can see then all the way on the right, which is uh, depending on the product, uh, different mechanisms, but the effect is always the same, that we chop, let's call it that we chop this current into several intervals. So once we reach a certain, certain threshold, uh, either of temperature or current, then we open uh, the e-fuse again, meaning we're letting the thing cool down and then we do that iteratively until we have reached a uh, full operative mode. All right. Now a last uh, question that is obviously on every customer's mind, which is um, they need to be fast uh, to the market, right? Zone architectures and electrified power distribution is still a new topic. So every month, every week, every year that you can be earlier to the market is worth money. And uh, obviously they want to achieve this. So they want something that is a uh, platform ready let's call it and here what we do have so you can see again our portfolio of smart switches we have standardized them as to their pin ins and pin outs also as to their software um, and if you uh, let the the two packages uh, overlay overlap you can see that uh, again there there is pin to pin compatibility making it really easy to replace uh, certain components and uh, put others there if for example you're saying we have a high a mid and a low version of a power distribution systems then uh, you do the same design you just pick different um, components that have di different characteristics electrical characteristics but they have the same footprint so you don't need to change the physical design all right. Um, another aspect in terms of go to uh, in terms of time to market is the reference designs, evaluation kits, and so on. So we have available here is a selection of such kits that might come in handy when talking about electrified power distribution. There is more. Uh, you can see all the websites. So feel free to have a look around there or contact us at Infineon if you have any questions or if you'd like to inquire more details. Um, on top of that, it's, it's not only reference designs, you also need some tools. And we will also later on uh, look into the tools that BERT has uh, in, in stock, which are very complementary to what I'm showing here. But on the semiconductor side of things, um, you can see it's color coded. I'm not going to talk you through all of it. We have tools for identifying products, selecting the right ones uh, for simulations, to extracting those simulations all the way to the validation. Um, here just one exemplary screenshot of how that's going to look uh, feel free to browse around uh, it's, it's a very good setup and uh, it's also quite intuitive so i'd really recommend to have a look there now at this point i'd like to hand over to isaac who will talk you through the passive component side of things yeah thanks timon for giving me the word um yeah, um, as we were talking already about uh, Zona Electronic Control Unit or the ECUs, here we can have um, a quick look on a block diagram of what is inside an ECU. A very simplified version, we have the microcontroller, we have the different communication port protocols, whether CAN, CAN FD, FlexRay, Ethernet or LIN, and the power management IC, and of course the power conversion switch. Um, so we will take a look today on which passive components that we can use for, for this kind of application. Um, so passive component, uh, when we are talking about power conversion, um, it is very important. And uh, we will uh, take a look on the next slides, what kind of things we should take care of when choosing the right um, inductor for power conversion. But EMC is also a very important topic when um, it comes to designing uh, power stages or communication lines. And as we can see here, we can use a lot of uh, combo chokes, whether for uh, for the power stage or for the communication lines where we have like high 
switching uh, uh, properties and high data rates. So of course we need from the design stage to take care of uh, COM mode noise that can appear in our application. Um, that's why using COM mode chokes uh, is pretty essential. Also for uh, differential mode noise, we have the filter chokes and the ferrites that can be used in combination with capacitors to uh, filter out uh, differential mode noises. And um, since we are talking about now high switching frequencies and um, high currents, um, its assembly uh, solutions are uh, pretty critical. So we need also connectors that can hold up higher currents, uh, which can be offered also by Virtual Electronic and can be see here, seen here. Um, another type of application um, is, of course, the gate drive applications. Um, another block diagram, very easy. It's more or less the same. Um, so as we can see, we can um, use the filtering or the DC conversion stage. Uh, but what is also essential is the isolation, which um, is a safety standard required by um, many automotive OEMs and for most of automotive applications. Um, and then um, the power magnetics can be offered for uh, for these kind of applications as a motor inverter or different ECUs like engine ECU, transmission ECU, or for onboard charging. Um, when we are talking about choosing the right inductor for the power conversion, um, now we are talking about higher switching frequencies where uh, we didn't talk about this um, in the past years, but now it's becoming um, very popular by introducing silicon carbide as an example or gallium nitride to um, to our applications. Um, so when we try to choose the right power inductor for our application, we need to know which power inductor would fit for this application. So here we have this diagram um, showing some uh, materials that can be used in inductors where we can see here for some materials they can cover up to uh, higher frequencies and some to lower frequencies. So as an example for ferrite, you can see they can uh, support up to 400 kilohertz, uh, while manganese zinc um, can support up to 10 megahertz uh, switching frequency and nickel zinc up to 40 megahertz. On the right side, you can see there are a lot of um, other combina combinations that uh, are offered by Vert Electronic where um, there are different composites um, of different materials um, so that we can get the best of each. So looking on the table on the next slide, um, I have took yeah, four of them to um, show what are the differences between these materials. So for very simple iron powder uh, core material, we see that um, it has the highest losses, uh, which is a drawback, of course, but it has also the lowest cost um, of all core materials. And we have seen um, that the frequency is up to 200 or 400 kilohertz. Um, a very good advantage of iron powder is that the saturation flux density um, goes up to 1.5 Tesla. Um, so it has um, higher saturation and um, can see that the temperature stability is not um, perfect for iron powder. When we take a look at nickel zinc, it offers the lowest score losses um, and um, also at a low cost. And as we have seen from the diagram, it supports up to 10 megahertz, um, but uh, we can see that its saturation flux density is almost three times less than the iron powder. For the WE perm, um, it's also um, a composite um, done by Virtual Electronic. We can see that we can have low core losses at a low cost and uh, having a frequency up to three megahertz, increasing the saturation flux density up to one Tesla with a better temperature stability than the other ones. For the super flux, um, we have here um, yeah, medium core losses with medium cost, uh, one megahertz, uh, up to one megahertz supported. And um, by this super flux um, combination, we can achieve saturation flux density up to 1.2 Tesla, and it has a very high temperature stability. So it's always about the 
uh, application that I'm trying to realize, I can choose uh, different core materials depending on that and which trade-offs um, I need to take uh, cons in considerations. Um, another thing that it's not shown directly in the data sheet, uh, or you need to look um, deeper in the data sheet at the saturation curve. So we have two types of saturation, um, hard saturation and soft saturation. And as you can see here for the hard saturation, um, we see that the inductance value drops abruptly at a certain uh, current. And um, for soft saturation material, we see a smooth uh, line due to the whole uh, saturation curve. So depending also on your application, if you have high current transients in, uh, in the application or expecting it, of course, in this case, you should use um, a soft saturation um, core material. And also for um, the hard saturation core material, it makes it um, less suitable because you can be working in um, this area if you are expecting higher currents and losing most of um, the inductance value or the original inductance value you are um, working on. Um, soft saturation materials are um, the power inductors with a powdered core like the ferrite, um, while the hard saturation material are mostly the metal alloys or high permeability iron alloys. Um, easier is to use um, one uh, of our tools, which is Red Expert. It's our simulation tool and search tool. On the left side, you can see here the different design tools, um, whether you are designing an EMI filter, a DC, DC, DC stage, or a more tools then to be seen here you can choose them directly and start putting your inputs and um, it will recommend you the right parts or you can directly search by product uh, by choosing the right product and um, you can um, take a look on what uh, parameters you are needing for your application so Taking a look um, here, when we open Red Expert, it always shows us a table with different parameters that we can filter. And uh, on the bottom side, we can see the different um, diagrams showing um, yeah, the parameters um, with different temperatures, as an example, saturation curves, and so on. Um, but the question is how to find the automotive parts. Um, so in this table, you will always find two columns. The first column is ACQ and the second column is automotive. So what does it mean? So for the ACQ parts, that means these parts have gone through the ACQ qualification tests and they have passed. And for the automotive parts, um, that means these um, parts are fully automated and all the documents are available for, for these parts. Um, taking a look here um, on at ECD stage, which comes as we have seen in the block diagram in the ECU, I can go directly to um, the design tool, choose a bug converter. And as I can see here, you can see I can put my input voltage, my output voltage, which switching frequency I will be working with, what is the ripple current um, on the inductor, and if it's uh, a synchronous or non synchronous DC DC converter. I can also choose here um, the suitable, that means it will show me only uh, on the table the suitable inductors that I can use for, for this application. And when I click on details, it will calculate for me the optimal um, inductance value. Of course, um, since you know that inductances have a tolerance uh, starting from plus minus 20%, and that means um, it's always good to have an inductance value higher and lower to try with for this application. On the bottom side, uh, you can see here some curves. So it's showing us the losses um, expected in this inductor. So AC losses, DC losses, uh, calculating the total losses and also the expected temperature change in Kelvin. Um, it is always good to take a look on the data sheet because um, we have already mentioned inductance value. You can see that um, there is a change, uh, plus minus 
Um, but taking a look also on the saturation current, saturation current is not um, actually defined at which percentage, as an example, it should be uh, set. So here you, on this data sheet, you can see two values, one time at 10% uh, decrease in the um, inductance value and one at 30%. Um, so um, it's always recommended to look at which uh, percentage is the saturation current defined and um, think if it works also for your application. You can see here for the rated current, we also have two values uh, which differ a lot from each other. Uh, so the first rated current we see that's at, uh, measured at a temperature increase of 40 Kelvin with 30 amps. And the second one is the so-called performance rated current measured also at 40 uh, Kelvin but we can see that the performance rated current is uh, almost the double or more than the double for, for the normal rated current. And this performance rated current is measured according to the IEC standard 62024. And um, it clearly defines how the measurement should be done to have a kind of uh, standardized measurement um, to show how uh, the rated current would be with this standard. However, looking at the here PCB trace is used for measuring the rated current, which is um, again defined in this standard. Um, probably it can also give you false information if you are using um, a thin trace as on the right side or a very thick copper trace on the left side, um, which acts as um, yeah, a heat sink, which will help of course um, dissipating heat from the inductor and allowing um, higher rated current values. So we can see here with less copper, we have um, almost um, 12 um, amps. And when we increase uh, copper trace, we achieve around 32 amps. So there is a big change in the rated current. And of course, you don't need to take a look on the IEC standards, how they are measured and what is the copper thickness and uh, calculate uh, that in relative to your um, used copper um, trace. So what we have in Red Expert is this uh, rated current calculator. So you can easily put the length, width and thickness of your copper trace you're using on your PCB. And you will always see here that um, the value will be shown uh, versus temperature for the expected rated current for your PCB trace you are using. Another aspect which um, comes for molded inductor. So for um, who doesn't know what molded inductor is, molded inductors are um, normal wound um, wires pressed uh, in ferrite material with some air gaps. Um, so the air, so you don't put the, the the core around the, the inductor, but it will be all molded together and the air gaps um, introduce um, this kind of air gap for energy storage. Um, we have here these traditional metal or alloy soft magnetic materials um, where they have no insulations between uh, or on the particles. So we can see also that there are uh, interparticle uh, eddy currents, um, which has a great impact, of course, on the heating and also the Q factor of, of the inductor. While here on the right side, we see the uh, soft magnetic composites where there is always an insulation material preventing these interparticle eddy currents um, to happen. But what happens when we introduce these uh, inductors to heat? Um, we have um, searched through that and um, we have this app note um, that you can also read um, with the link below. And uh, on the right side, you can see some pictures of the electron, electrical, um, electron microscope. Um, here it is before the introducing the inductor to the heat. And on the right side, um, it's after introducing the inductor for 200 degrees Celsius for 1000 hours. And uh, we can see already here that um, there are some burnings on the insulation material between um, on the particles 
um, which in return causing these uh, eddy currents to appear and become more dominant. So if we look on uh, some measurements that has been done here on the left side, um, comparing inductance value of uh, one of our inductors, the LHMI, with other competitors, we can see that we uh, have for all of them, yeah, the, they are still in the tolerance of the 20 plus minus 20% for the inductance value after exposing them to um, in the 1,000 uh, hours at 200 degrees. Uh, while taking a look on the right diagram at the Q factor, uh, we can see that for some of the competitor inductors, um, a huge decrease in the Q factor, which makes them yeah, not um, not working anymore and will not fit for uh, for the application. Um, so that's a very important aspect, especially in automotive industry, that you need um, your uh, power stage to be always working and not fail after some time. There is also another app note talking about the voltage specifications for the molded inductor. Um, and with the link added, you can take a look at it um, and reach out if you have any questions about it. On our website, you will find all uh, the standard uh, products portfolio for automotive. Um, for the different applications, um, you can see, um, as I already mentioned, um, the ferrites, filter chokes, and com mode chokes, and the power inductors, isolated gate drivers. Um, also, we have a team working on customized solutions. So if you need a product that is not available on uh, the automotive standard portfolio, you can get in contact with us and, and we can uh, work on a customized solution. Uh, we are offering also different design kits with um, different uh, product families that you can use for fast prototyping um, and uh, have it handy at your lab. So here, a uh, quick look on the newest parts we have on our automotive portfolio. Um, we for signal and communication as for CAN and CAN FD. Um, we have the CNSA in the size 1210, um, and um, it can be used um, as mentioned for CAN or A to B uh, applications. For power applications, um, we have the new HCFAT which is a high current inductor with flat wire, um, which uh, has advantage, of course, working perfectly at higher switching frequencies and also having a very low um, RT and DC resistance. So it can take currents up to 175 amps. And for um, yeah, small size um, inductors, shielded inductors, we have the HEPA. Um, in two new sizes and um, also in a fully automated automotive product line with up to two amps. For the molded inductors, we have the LHCA. It's a SMD molded power inductor um, introducing four sizes um, with very high uh, saturation currents at this size, um, up to 95 amps with also a very low RDC. And for MC components, we have the new uh, OEFA LFS, the EMC suppressor bead um, for data line uh, cables and connections, reaching impedance up to 112 ohms at 100 megahertz. So that's the new uh, the newest part um, on on the portfolio, and um, keep updated also for more parts to come on our automotive standard portfolio. All right. Thank you very much, Isaac. Uh, quite impressive, comprehensive deep dive into the, the passive side uh, of power distribution systems. Um, now, we'd like to quickly summarize what we've learned. And uh, it was a lot of information, but we've boiled it down to three major things that we'd like to uh, that we'd like you to remember. And I think we can start off uh, with the first one right away, which is that um, e-fuses are the better fuses and with e-fuses i mean semiconductor devices so smart power switches or slash and gate driver ic's plus mosfets um i've shown how they can effectively uh, replace fuses but they have other benefits such as uh, online resettability diagnosability and so on 
Now, the second takeaway, it's already here up on the slide, is that every semiconductor uh, somehow implies the need for passive components as well. And that Infineon and BIRD have a very complementary portfolio. Um, so there is a lot of uh, good products available that will help you to buy, uh, sorry, to build your power distribution systems of the future. And that brings me to the last takeaway, the third one, which is um, your entry points to all this combined knowledge and all this product portfolio is, first of all, our web pages. There is a lot of information, a lot of design in collaterals available, but then obviously also reach out to your sales representatives, to your Word or Infineon contacts if you have any questions and like to inquire further details. All right, with that, I think uh, it's time to say thank you very much for your attention. And we are happy uh, if in the meanwhile, any questions have popped up in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Timon, and thanks for my side as well. Now, time for questions. Yeah, thank you for your interesting presentation. Now we'll come to your questions. Um, I would say we can directly start with the first question. Um, when and how do you think a shift to 48 volt will come? Okay, uh, that's a more uh, electronic question, so I will take this one. Um, so I've, I've pointed that out on one of my first slides. This is one of the measures that the OEMs are taking, and it correlates to two of the goals that I've mentioned. One is uh, to save on systems costs, and the other one was electromobility. Now, electromobility requires more energy, also within the low voltage coordinates. So 48 volt is a eligible uh, solution there to transport this energy. The question, when will it come, depends really on the trade-off between the two goals, because currently it still implies a bit higher costs while giving you this technical benefit of higher power. Um, in the future, it will not, and yeah, the, the tipping point will be somewhere between 2025 and 2030, but uh, the actual shift depends very much on, on the OEM and the system that they are looking at specifically. Okay, thank you, Timon. Um, then. We will come to the next question. <coughs> Sorry. Um, you mentioned that both MOSFETs as well as smart power switches can be used as e-fuses. When do you use which one? All right. So um, that is correct. Uh, we, we can either use smart power switches or gate drivers plus MOSFET. The smart power switch is essentially an integrated device that includes the gate driver, the MOSFET, as well as some additional peripherals. Um, the difference is that uh, you will end up having a, a more value uh, efficient design um, when choosing MOSFETs for higher currents. So we typically talk about 40 amps uh, and, and on top, uh, so beyond. And below 40 amps, you would typically go for integrated solutions because there, the additional uh, cost of the component do not outweigh the, the benefit that you're getting um, in, in terms of integration effort, for example. So beyond 48 amps, above 48 amps, uh, you would typically go for gate driver plus a MOSFET below that smart power switches. Okay, thank you. Then next question why do do we use iron power if nickel zinc is able to cover all the frequency so i guess this question is for me um yeah we have seen already the on the table that i've shown um it's not only about the cost maybe the cost will not be um the biggest impact but we have seen for nickel zinc they, it has a uh, much lower saturation uh, current um, than the iron powder, which is three times less. So if you are working with higher currents, um, iron powder wouldn't, uh, and nickel zinc wouldn't be the right uh, core material to choose. Okay, thank you. Then I would say last question. How accurate are the lo loss curves in Red Expert? Yeah, that's something I forgot to mention um, that all the curves you see in Red Expert are uh, are not simulations. They are real measurements um, that you can uh, depend on and expect to see also in your real application um, where we take um, like a very high accuracy, accuracy measurement uh, setup to measure all the parameters for the inductor and put it on Red Expert for you so that um, it is for you also 
uh, having your power design stage uh, very accurately before even uh, starting with the PCB design. Thank you very much. Okay, then I think this was the last question. When you have um, one question left, you can write into the chat and then um, Timon and Isaac or Isaac will answer it via email in the next days. So many thanks to Isaac and Timon. Cool to have you here. Um, yeah, thank you for your presentation and for all the answers. And um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it and hopefully we see us on our next Wood Electronic webinar. Thank you and goodbye. It was a pleasure. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.